Hi guys, welcome back to the Earthy Delights podcast, brought to you by Beer Eye. Yes, that's right folks, we have finally got an official sponsor. We're happy to announce that we've partnered up with Beer Eye, a YouTube channel who help promote mental health conversations with friends when sharing a beverage, alcoholic or otherwise. They're a great channel with the same aim as ours, so go support them and go check them out. We're bringing you this podcast with two of the founders of Beer Eye, George and Jake, and they talk to us about their inspiration, what triggered their mental health journey, and why they've started Beer Eye, and what are their aims for Beer Eye. We hope you enjoy it. So without further ado, let's start with what's the crack? George, Jake, what is the crack? How's, how's everything going? Yeah, not bad, I suppose. Um had a little bit of an issue with my landlord this morning where uh, about a gallon of water decided to pour through my ceiling. Um which is not what you want first thing on a Saturday. But um, yeah, apart from that, I'm, I'm all well. I'm all well. The weather's a bit grim, but I promise you I'm uh, all's good on my side, yeah. Good stuff. Jake, how are we doing? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling okay. I'm feeling a little bit uh, on the hungover side. Uh, <laughs> but I'm looking at a glass of water can't fix. Uh, but yep. everything else is good otherwise. Very, very good. Very, very happy. Very blessed to be uh, on this. How about you, chaps? How are you getting on? Beautiful. I'm not too bad in Madrid, so I can't say that the weather's shabby over here. It's pretty fucking pristine, if I'm being honest. Um, yeah, so I, I swapped England a long time ago, and Boris Johnson isn't making that decision look any bad at all. So um, I'm, I'm happy over here. This is the first um, recording we've done on a Saturday morning, so uh, I feel actually somewhat productive. You know, Normally, I'd still be in bed at this hour, so uh, no, it's all good. I'm looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have. Jimbo, what about yourself? Doing good. Uh, yeah, I'm just very happy it's the weekend. Nice plans ahead. Yeah, looking forward to relaxing. Where I do, are you based? I'm based in Dublin. Lovely. Uh, they, give that beautiful accent and give it away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Jake, I have to ask about uh, your tricks for, for like beating the hangover because uh, I've had like legendary hangovers, which has kind of stopped me from being able to drink more than like four or five beers because I just can't do it anymore. But I'm wondering, like, do you have any golden, you know, tricks like, ah, oh, I'm hungover, but this will do it. I think everybody always looks for like the perfect hangover cure of, of something that they're just going to do. And in 10 minutes, they, they're going to feel fine and not feel uh, horrendous anymore. But I just don't think that exists. Yeah, or I've, yeah. I've, I've never found it. I just think... If you get, if you mong in bed and sit in bed, you're gonna feel so much. Get up and have a shower. Yeah. That's, that's the one thing. Like, yeah. have a shower and have a Barocca. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> you want that extra thing that you've left out, but don't want to put on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fight. Nefarious activity shall be left out of the podcast. <laughs> get a beep in there. But, <laughs> but um, no, I, mate, I find preventions better than cure. Like. Honestly, if you just like through the night, have like, it sounds weird, but if you can manage, especially like on pre-drinks, whatever, manage to get a few pints of water in. And then if you finish it, uh, finish the night off with like some beautiful chips, maybe cheesy chips and gravy, soaks it all up. You wake up the next day dandy. I'm telling you. I mean, guess the first place to start here is um, like George, I was introduced to you by our good friend, Rosie, mutual friend. Uh, First guest ever, first ever guest on the podcast. She holds a special place in this podcast heart. But, um, and she just told me that like you were kind of uh, interested in mental health. You started up a, um, like a little venture called Pom Welfare, I believe on, on Instagram, like kind of like gift hampers and stuff for people who are struggling and which I thought was a beautiful idea. And initially we were going to kind of just, I mean, this interview has been scheduled for about a year now. So initially we were going to talk about that and now you're doing another project called beer ride. But before we get onto any of that stuff, um, where did like this all start for you? Like what was there a trigger? Was there anything? Cause I know when I started my mental health journey, it was because there was a trigger. I think there's, I think, mate, I don't want to speak for Jim, but I think Jim's a substantially better human being than I am. And maybe he was just kind of always been interested in it anyway and didn't necessarily need that trigger. But I definitely did. Like, Was that the case for you or have you always kind of been interested in it? I'd, I'd love to say I've always had the, uh, the I suppose, the, the mental depth to, to be aware of mental health, but I, I didn't in truth. I, I'm, growing up, I was a pretty dense kid. Um, I didn't have a pretty hard life. I mean, every kind of issue I dealt with, which would, would have been like a, a breakup, an argument with my friends, failing an exam. Um, I dealt with through rugby and through sport and through kind of physical exertion. Um, and that was easy for me. I mean, in terms of kind of my emotional range back then, the, the most emotional I got was kind of sitting in the back of a car, listening to Boulevard of Broken Dreams while it rained outside. <laughs> one day. I was a, a woke indie kid. But um, apart from that, yeah. there was nothing there that made me think about my uh, 
so it's my, my mental well-being, my mental health. Um, then went off to uni, went off to Nottingham, um, which is an absolute dream for me. I mean, I don't want to chuck the phrase rugby lad about because it's 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 so many negative connotations to it. But I suppose at that mm. point in my life, I was I was ticking every one of those boxes in terms. of Love going out, very outgoing character. Love playing my rugby. Love the boozing side. Uh, studying a bit of a backseat, uh, as it sometimes does when you don't get the balance right. But I was loving uni, man. It was so good. That's where I met Jake mm. uh, up in Nottingham. Uh, and then it got to the end of my first year, which I'd absolutely loved. And I, um, I went down to play some rugby down back in London. And I, I tore my ACL uh, playing rugby, which, I mean, Jim, you're an Arsenal fan. Seb, you're an Arsenal fan. So I know you've seen Bella yeah. and do it. Uh, yeah, a few ACLs. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's a horrid injury to have. And the fact that I was studying uh, physiotherapy and rehabilitation, kind of I knew straight away that I'd done it when I did do it because I kind of poetic justice here. I'd done a presentation on ACL ruptures the week before for my end of year presentation. So did it and I was like, this isn't nice. I can feel this. Um, so yeah, I think I, from there when I had the scan, they told me I wouldn't be able to play rugby for, for at least at least a year. Uh, I'd have to have an operation, quite a, a kind of in-depth one. And it basically took away my only coping mechanism and the only mechanism I'd mm. have. Um, so suddenly I was kind of had this light cast in me where up until then, every issue, whether it was anger, sadness, emotion, joy, had come through being able to physically exert it and show it physically. So when that was taken away from me, I found myself quite immediately in a, in a pretty dark place. And I suppose I look back at it now and it's, it's for the best, but I also lost my identity there as, as, a, as this rugby player, this outgoing rugby player. Mm. Where one of the things I identified most in myself, one of my main qualities, as embarrassing as it sounds, I didn't have anymore. So I got to this point where I was like, shit, I don't really recognize who I am. I look in the mirror anymore. And it quite quickly spiraled where I couldn't exert that emotion. And suddenly I didn't know how to, how to address it when I got angry or when I got sad or whenever that happened. I yeah. had no idea how to really talk about it or express it. So I ended up, Quite weirdly, I got, got to a point in, in, in probably the start of second year, right through second year, where I'd just be in my room and I just I just burst into tears like on, on most days for no apparent reason. And then when I wasn't having that kind of crazy burst of, of I suppose, of sadness and, and frustration more than anything, I just felt numb to a point where I was like, I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to go to lectures. I can't go to the gym. I don't want to see any of my mates. And it was just like, it was waves of that where I just sat there doing nothing, not on Netflix, not looking out the window, not reading, just sat there doing nothing for hours at a time. And I was there and I was wallowing my own pity very much. I was like, this is the way it has to be. I can't play rugby anymore. This is so shit. My life's rubbish. I hate this. And it got to a point where I really started despising myself, um, where I was like, God, I, I, I'm actually pathetic in the way that I'm acting. It had a lot of effects on my uh, my relationship at the time. It was turned quite toxic. Uh, I didn't. I ended up getting quite angry at random stuff. I was getting upset by random stuff. I couldn't control my emotions. Mm. Um, and it continued like that, really. And it was weird because none of the boys will have a clue about this. And I'm sure most of the people I knew at uni will have no idea either. Because when I was okay, when I was fine, and when I went out, I was still the same person, albeit I couldn't I couldn't do the splits or, or dance around as much as I could. <laughs> uh, my knee was in pieces. But I think mentally, whenever I was on my own, it was a real kind of weakness there. I was like, God, I absolutely hate this. And I masked it for so, so long. Didn't know how to broach the subjects. Didn't know how to address it. And I kind of, it got worse because of that. To a point where I ended up having to leave university, or I chose to leave university, albeit it was a it was a kind of jump before you push decision. I think more than anything, um, probably because it wasn't the right placement at the time at all. I mean, the university. Uh, I mean, they they I say they did what they could. They didn't do what they could, but they were over over kind of subscribed with mental health issues with loads of students at the time. So I understand I wasn't the only one ticking that box, but there was not a lot of help there from my course or from the from the uni. So I took the decision out of their kind of out of their hands and, and left. Um, I'm kind of just thought to myself at the start of my third year, or would have been my third year, right? I've I've kind of hit this low point now. I, I hate where I at. I hate where I'm at. I've put a ton of weight on. I'm not the person I recognise. I look like an absolute mess. Um, what can I do about it? And I very very luckily ended up just meeting or getting together with my, my current girlfriend, who I suppose kind of gave me a bit of a wake up call as to um, how to deal with these things and that realising that wallowing and sitting in that dark pit of, of pity isn't isn't the right way to go about it. And then it was that moment there. I kind of had a bit of a light bulb moment, and I was just like, right, pick yourself up. And just start working by it day by day because I mean it's not a you realize and suddenly you're okay again suddenly you're mentally because mm. you don't get to that point in, in one spot it's a it's a day by day thing and look some days some days I'll feel fantastic and I'll put a streak in of feeling great for three weeks and then something will happen or sometimes nothing will happen and I'll just wake up feeling like absolute shit and I'll, I'll kind of drop down again but it's just knowing full well and, and trusting the process and that if you if you if you're aware of it and you, you know how to deal with it then you, you can kind of get out of it fairly quickly so i suppose now it's not it's not a cure to it but it's definitely a management and understanding it a lot more and that understanding and education on my side of what mental health is and mental well-being is really really helps and i suppose that's where the um the pump thing came in because i realized god if i'd had something like that when i first when i first started up or when i uh, when i reached that place it could have really helped and yeah to give you an idea of what pom is basically it's a it was a, it was it's a gift a, a kind of a gift 
welfare box service. So if you've got a mate who you think is struggling with their mental health or seems a bit down for whatever reason, it could be a breakup, it could be dropping out of uni or failing or failing their degree or nothing at all. It could be because of nothing. Because I think we need to normalise the fact that sometimes people feel shit and get down just because that's the way their brain works and feeling yeah. fun. So it was a way to send a box either anonymous, anonymously or with your name on it just to say, look, hey, mate, I know you're feeling down. Um, feel free to drop me a message or get in touch if you want to, but there is someone here to speak. And in the box, there was some herbal teas, stress balls, adult colouring books. I mean, nothing that's a cure to mental health, but it's certainly a way to open up that door. I mean, that's all I wanted to do was open up that door. And I think been able to promote that conversation and promote what was wrong with me at the time, say what was wrong, what I went through, not what was wrong with me, was super helpful in terms of kind of my mental health journey and getting back on my feet was the ability to kind of help other people and really kind of I suppose break that stigma because it's it's as much as people like talking about now and throwing mental health about and mental well-being about, there's a lot of stigma about, which is why we're kind of here now to talk about it, because you can say all you want, oh, it's fine if, if you're if you're depressed or if you're anxious, if you're not feeling yourself, but how many people are actually comfortable having that conversation with their mates and saying, mate, you don't yeah. like, let's let's talk and it's not many. And I mean, pick my hand yeah. and I'll say when uh, me and Jake spoke about this podcast last week, we realised that we'd uh, never actually directly spoken about that journey or how I got into that spot. And I think Jake was pretty surprised in terms of how I was feeling and how I got into it because he had no idea. Mm. He was going through that journey himself. But um, I suppose that brings me up to now, really, as in not thick, yeah. not better, but certainly more aware of my surroundings and, and what makes me tick. I mean, that was a beautiful answer, but there was a couple of points there that I definitely resonated with in going through, like thinking back to my own journey w- with mental health is um, the identity thing. And Jim and I talk massively like loads about identity on and off the podcast. Um, but you spoke about like how you, the loss of identity and then also the upkeeping of a certain kind of identity with your friends in terms of when you're going out. And I definitely, when I went through my mental health, which was kind of all triggered by um, like, tragedy within the family and stuff like that um there's a, a few different scenarios but it was all in the family nucleus and i like being italian and whatever else kind of had this idea that family is the be all and end all and i never thought of certain members of my family kind of failing me so to speak so when that kind of that um that image was kind of shattered uh that i had they were my foundations and then my foundations were shattered basically so that was what made me go start my mental health journey but then what you said as well but trying to up up keep something i was always you know i think like in friendship groups i think we all kind of bring something different to a friendship group we all have a certain kind of um kind of character that we kind of uphold you know you have the mother hen you have the happy-go-lucky lad you have the idiot guy you have whatever it may be every friendship group is different i happen to be like the kind of happy-go-lucky always trying to crack a joke and be a bit dry with my sense of humor and do you know what I mean and and I like that aspect of me but then obviously when I was going through all of all of my own personal shit it felt hard to upkeep that kind of that facade because I that's not how I felt anymore but yet I felt like it was my duty to my friends to do that yeah um you know I did that for a, a period of time where on the outside it looked all dandy and it was only when I got to complete kind of like breaking point that I had to, yeah, my friends would say the classic, oh, how are you, mate? You're right. And instead of just being, yeah, mate, I'm good, blah, blah, blah. I would just like go for, I'd go all in, actually, mate, boom. And then I just lay it all out. And these are my best friends and they're all like, oh my God, I can't believe it. Like, like I, I'd never have thought of it. You're sad. Like, this is, do you know what I mean? You're always laughing, blah, blah. And I was wondering, like, do you think that kind of notion that you had to like upkeep this kind of rugby lad persona or whatever it was that you felt like you kind of brought to your friendship group. Did, did that harm you and kind of like put on the brakes to what would be, be your journey to improving your mental health? A hundred percent. I think the reason for that is because at the time I didn't think there was anything more to my personality. As far as I was concerned, mm. my characteristics and my, my qualities, which I still have now I'm outgoing, I'm loud, I'm, I'm outspoken, I'm, I'm bullshit. I'm, yeah. Class is arrogant by some people, depending on which side of the coin you flip it on. Mate, snap! I feel like I'm. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm like looking into a mirror here. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not a bad looking mirror then. But, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's that, exactly I like, what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> but with that, it was like um, I thought those characters, characteristics were linked to the fact that I played rugby and that I, I was could go to the gym and I was this big gym going rugby lad who could smash a pint in in three four seconds and that was me. And then I realised. Once I stopped pretending to be okay and kind of focused on becoming I suppose, a, kind of that next level of myself and, and, and learning a bit more about myself and how I functioned, those qualities are still there now. And I'm still that person. All I've realized is that it wasn't linked to the fact that I played rugby or that I could 
smash a load of points. It was linked to the fact that CIM was a person, but there's this whole other side to me where there is this emotional depth that I have to take into account now and that I'm not the same person I was two, three years ago before I did that to my knee and before I went through that horrible kind of period of my life. But I genuinely now, looking back on it, I would not change a thing because I look back on that person before I tore my knee and I'm not a big fan of that bloke as a whole, as that, as that stereotype, as, as the stereotype goes for rugby lads and that personality type. I was all the good sides of that, but also all the negative sides of that too. So if I could look back on that day, I, I dropped a lot of the negative qualities. I mean, I'm sure I've still got a few of them. And I'm not a saint by any means. It definitely helped me kind of self-reflect to a point where I realized, right, okay, there were parts of you that were a massive, massive cock. And um, that wake-up call, uh, however kind of demoralizing it was at the time, has really helped me step through that now to be a bit more aware of, of the people around me, their feelings when I speak, uh, how I make them feel and, and how I can deal with that. So it's, 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 I, it's a tough thing to go through, but it's definitely being seen as a positive for me, which I think is a massive part of it. Yeah, I think the, the problem that a lot of us face is the idea that identity is fixed. You know, and someone say, oh, I know who you are. Oh, I know you are. Oh, I knew him. It's yeah. it's not acknowledging that like every day we could be different. Like we could see something differently one day and then see something differently another day. And <clears throat> if you just say it like for me, like if I just say I'm this type of person and then when I'm around this group of friends, I have to be this person. It's yeah. it's very limiting. It's very constricting. And you're not actually allowing yourself who you could potentially could be. You know, like the, the thoughts of who you are can kind of limit who you actually can be. You're spot on there. And I think sometimes friendship groups can be quite uh, detrimental to yeah. that in a way that yeah. one person taking that is a big thing for them because then it's a case of, God, he's changed. What's going on with yeah. them? It's, it's grown as mature. You know, I've got mates I'm still mates with now from, from six years old and we've grown up together. But bloody hell, I'd like to hope I'm not the same person I was when I was six. This is uh, it. And do you ever notice like very often that you've changed has a negative connotation? Yeah, it's never a comment. You've changed, yeah. It's a, God, you've changed, man. (laughs) It's like, oh, yeah, you want me to stay the same, the exact same for the last 10 years. Yeah, mate, pardon me if I'm not uh, not paying the gesture and uh, slapping eggs in my head anymore like I did when I was 10. (laughs) Tell you what, I probably wouldn't be employed if I had the same uh, sense of humour or mental ability, albeit that's not changed too much. But, um, yeah, spot on. And that's what it comes down to, finding a set of mates who can really understand you, you can really talk to and and open up to. Because otherwise... I don't know, if you feel like you can't talk to mental health with your mates, you need to either have that conversation or, or kind of find some mates that aren't scared of the conversation or, or won't put you down for having it. I think that's, that's the stigma that is still surrounded by mental health. Is that it, it's very easy to sit on here and be like, oh, uh, I would love to go and speak to my mates about this. Uh, and actually, I probably could, but it's about your friends then reaching out to you. I think that's, mm. that's the thing is that it's, it's very rare for boys or men to reach out to each other it's very, it's very easy for me to go to one of my friends and say, look, I'm having this problem. But I think it's it's a rarity to find friends that literally just out of the blue just call you to check in on you and just see how you're doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, think, I think that's to do with the stigma that's surrounded by it. Um, yeah. and, it and it's how you change that. Is it just talking about it more? What what What's the point? What's the tipping point where it's going to be like, oh, okay, right now it's okay to talk about it. Now it's okay to ask one of my friends uh, if they're okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I've like... When I went to a boarding school, I like grew up around there's there's a mixed boarding school and there were girls and boys and so like I never went to in those traditional kind of um, all boys you know and then only maybe mix when either you're at sixth form or even potentially later at at uni and I genuinely when I see some of those boys I don't want to sound patronising but I genuinely feel sorry for them because I feel like having female friendship in my life my whole life has been a salvation of sorts because they are always not only do they want they're happy to have those conversations but what i found as well and i'm guilty of this but they don't want to necessarily solve it girls i mean they don't want to give you a solution whereas i think like stereotypically speaking like men are like these like fixers and so whenever and it's the same with me like when people come to me with a problem and i work on it now to try and just listen but before i would be like oh, okay well what you need to do or what i think you should do is this this and this and this and it's like mate like i don't i'm not coming to you for like you're not jeremy kyle i don't want you to give me solutions here i just want you to like listen not and i think as well like, wants advice from jeremy well kyle. true <laughs> well, that's true but in a much worse mental state that <laughs> yeah but um but as well i think as well some some of like i've i've had these conversations like with some of my best mates who are lads and uh Sometimes it, I feel like they don't even have uh, the like the vocabulary to kind of go into these conversations. And I can see it when, you know, they kind of know 
some of them know intimately what I've been going through and we have like very good conversation about it. But some of them know that I've gone through a rough time, but they don't really know what. And then depending on which day of the week it is, I'll kind of expand on that or not. And sometimes I see it and like, these are my best friends. I'm not calling that they're, they're not any worse people for this, but I can literally see them like freezing up. Because yeah. I think they know, like, intrinsically, like, oh, shit, this is, like, my best mate. Like, I want to help him. But then on the flip side of it, it's like, I have no fucking idea what to say. I don't know how to help him. I don't know what to do. And I can I can physically sit in their, their body language, everything. And they freeze up. And, the, and the, the most common answer I get is something along the lines of, oh, man, that's so shit. Like, I'm so sorry you're going through that. Like, did you see uh, did you see a Bam Yang's goal last weekend? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And they yeah. flip it. And it's like, oh, and then I understand. Like, I don't want to put them in an awkward position either so then i understand oh, okay cool like he's not ready for this conversation or whatever and then i'm like yeah bam you know, goal was mate and we talk about football or whatever the case may be and it's like if we could kind of somehow i think it's happening but kind of turn that ship tank and get boys to really kind of not feel too awkward about it i mean i'll be like you said here like you two have only just kind of spoken to each other about your own mental health journeys and we've had guests on some of them who are our friends and we've got some guests planned who I mean, me anyway, I should say, I should say Jim, but I haven't had these, the only reason I'm having these conversations is because I have a mental health podcast, yeah. but I haven't spoken to them in person through either be it my own fault or their fault or a mixture of the two. We haven't had the conversation and it's kind of paradoxical. So you're not going to have that conversation in private, but you will have it on a podcast when there's like thousands of listeners. Well, that doesn't <laughs> really make too much sense, but like that's honestly, it's been like having the podcast has been a facilitator for those conversations. And I don't know exactly, I don't know what the answer is. I, for me, I found that the only answer is to just to keep on trying and to keep on having the conversations yeah. as often as possible. You know, the thing right. is, I think everybody's in terms of mental health, everybody's mental health is, is different. It's not, it's not a case of it's like uh, BLM, which I feel like everybody should support. It's not a case of um, trans or gay rights, which everybody should support. Like everybody's mental health journey is different. Everybody deals with things in different ways. Everybody um, has different triggers, has different reasons why they're feeling the way that they're feeling. So I don't think there's one right answer in how to deal with it and how to treat it. Yeah, um, I, think, I think it's important to sort of know your limits as a friend yeah. as well. Like you're not a counselor, you're not a psychotherapist, you're not, uh, a medical professional I, sometimes it is literally just a case of sitting there and letting somebody speak to you and let yeah. yeah. pour out their feelings to you I think what's tough yeah. sometimes though and it's the case of a lot of my mates some of my best best mates who I love more than anything in the world and I will, will be mates with them to the day I die I know they've not got the, oh, I say not some emotional depth but they've not gone through what I've gone through or had a point mm. where they've been able to take that journey or look into their own mental health so for them it's like they don't understand it because they've not been through it. And I'm not saying that they're better off because of that or they're, they're emotionally shallow, but that because they've not been through that or felt like that way, then it's really hard to talk about. And I mean, if I say to one of my mates, God, I'll be driving in the car one day on the way home from Nottingham and I suddenly forget how to breathe and have a panic attack in the car and have to pull over to the side of the road and sit there for an hour on the hard shoulder. They'd be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Just drive or like, cause it's like, it is such a hard thing to, it's not like a broken leg where you see it and you go, God, that looks nasty. And we can all agree looking at it. That's a nasty broken leg or God, you bruised yourself there. It's something that can't be can't be seen, and the only way mm. you can describe it is by talking about it. And when you talk with your words, it's like, yeah, I can sort of see what you're talking about because I've not been through it myself. I can only go, that must be shit, mate. But I don't know what you're talking about. So, yeah, let me handle. Yeah, I mean, I've one of my best mates. Uh, shout out Ollie, but um, he's like one of my best mates from home, and like, I mean, I always say you don't exactly know what's happening you know within the four walls of anyone's household but on the surface of it and to his own admission he's kind of had like the quote-unquote perfect life you know pe parents still happily married not been too many like not really been any traumas to speak of in his childhood or whatever else and yet he's actually one of the ones who i have some of the best conversations about it with i think because he listens he doesn't freeze up he know and he and he knows what you've said he always says to me man i can't imagine what it is you're going through but like i'm happy to talk i'm happy to listen whenever you do you know i mean like he acknowledges that he hasn't he can't empathize fully because he can't relate it to anything similar yeah. but he's just willing to kind of where i feel like a lot of people will have that um they, they, they can't empathize fully and instead of just going i can't empathize i'm just going to sit here and listen and and offer any kind of advice that i think might be useful they just kind of they don't want to get into that because that's murky waters and then they just they flip it but before we get too much into this jake what's so what's like your journey what was the trigger for you what's how did your like journey for mental health start um it's it's a difficult one i've never 
I've never really spoken about it out loud to that many people. But when when I was at uni, I think the first year of my university, I still say, was without a doubt the best year of my life. Like, enjoyed it mm. so much. Like, literally had everything going for me. Um, it was all going so well. Uh, and then basically just through, I think, my own Im- immaturity, um, just thinking that basically I was the dog's bollocks. Um, mm. I sort of had a girlfriend and and got with someone else when I was on a night out. Um, and, and that just kind of fell apart. Um, and I think because I'd never experienced anything like that before, I'd never known what heartbreak was. I never really understood it. Um, I think it just sent me into a massive spiral. Um, and it it got to the point where I was on uh, sertraline, um, the antidepressant, um, sort of kept increasing dosage and dosage and dosage. I lost a shitload of weight. I just didn't eat. Um, and, and ended up going home for a long time. And really, a little bit like Georgie said as well, just completely lost um, my sense of identity. I, I didn't really feel like myself. I literally just felt like the shell and like, I just felt numb all the time. Everywhere I went, um, any, any night out that we went on, I just didn't. I just didn't go out, and I just felt so unbelievably, like inside, shattered. Like for me, an achievement, like at my lowest, was being able to get up and go for a shower. Like that, that mm-hmm. to me was like a like a big step. And when I was at home, I had my mum, who was a like the most amazing support. She's a psychotherapist, and like I think she just knew how to deal with it. But she would. I remember the first time that I uh, laughed after all this happened, she cried. Mm. Um, and I think that's just a telling thing is that you just completely use, lose all sense of yourself, any any idea of uh, enjoyment of life or anything that you would normally find funny um, just completely goes out the window and you just become this shell of a person. And like by my own admission, like the reason that that relationship ended was <clears throat> my fault. I completely understand that and I hold my hands up, but um, it doesn't, it doesn't prepare. And I actually, I think it being your own fault probably made it worse for me because I was like, yeah, I was going to say, fair play. Like I I kind of deserve to feel like this because it was my fault that it happened. Um, It was just a very, very difficult time. And I think Mm -hmm. now, now I understand, do you know what? I'm actually, I know it sounds weird, but like, I'm kind of happy that I went through it. I'm happy Mm -hmm. that I dealt with those emotions. I'm happy that I, I realized what being low was and being depressed was because it makes you appreciate the things that you have in life now and, and, Mm. and how you go about life as well. Um, I think an important thing as well is that I was, I was such a confident outgoing person as, as Georgie was as well. And I think there's such a stigma around the idea of when you see the idea of mental health, people are fine or they're suicidal self-harming and there's no, there's no like middle ground or in between ground. And I think, it's important coming on a podcast like this and speaking about it because it shows that people that are like me and Georgie that are outgoing, outspoken, um, confident, it can quite easily affect you. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think I think that's that was really my mental health journey and it sort of led me to start <clears throat> things at my work. So I've just set up a uh, sort of mental health program at my work because I think there wasn't one and there needed to be one. I think mm. it's important. Um, and so, and then obviously BRI with, with the two of us and, and Rishi as well. And, and just doing things that promote a conversation. Um, yeah. and I don't think that anybody should be sort of trying to give out, um, medical advice or anything like that. I just think that it's, it's important to sit down, listen, know your limits and, and know what you can offer a friend. And if that is literally just someone to chat to, um, that can, that can be enough. Yeah, I think bear in mind at this point, me, me and Jake were living in the same house and this was going on exactly the same time. So God bless the housemates we were living at the time. I mean, they, they, they had an absolute fucking ride on their hands at that point because, I mean, it was not a very positive place to live, which was um, yeah. fostering a lot of other issues in itself. But thanks, guys, if you're listening. I know some of you will. <laughs> it's funny. I was only saying to Seb during the week how I really think the breakdown is actually like the breakthrough, you know, like, if you didn't have that low, then you wouldn't have this new sense of like, I don't know if it's clarity or meaning or assurance, or I don't know what to call it, but without that low, you couldn't have how you feel now, you know, your oh. appreciation of life now. I, think it is, I genuinely think it is clarity. I think it's, I think it's gaining a perspective on, on the things that happen in your life and actually, actually the, deg- the degree of how important they are. Like 
before before all of this happened, I could look at something and get so angry, so worked up about the smallest thing, uh, or upset about the smallest thing. And now, if something happens, it's, it's being able to take a step back, deal with it, um, and and just understanding that actually you've been through so much worse, and there, there is such a there's such a long way down. But it's when you get back up, it's it's just the best feeling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean. When I, like, I'm gonna, not going to lie, like before I kind of went through it all, I wasn't exactly a believer in mental health. I'm not going to lie. I just kind of thought like, oh, I was ke- typical kind of bloke mentality. Just like, oh, pff, what does that mean? You're depressed. You're just a bit sad. Like, make yeah. sure you get on with it. Like, it's life. Do you know what I mean? Like, just every, you're going to have ups and downs. It is what it is. Like, just put a smile on your face and it, it, everything will be right as rain soon enough. And then you kind of go through it. I, like you said, there's varying stages. I don't, I don't even think I've had even close to what would be classed as kind of the worst of it. Yeah. But even just kind of having that little taste was enough where you go, oh shit, I was a complete moron. Like, of course this stuff is real. And yeah, I think having, like you said, it's just the conversation is, it is, it sounds kind of cr- like cringy and just a bit cliche. Like, oh, we need to do is just have a conversation, just open up. But it really is that because I feel like, at least for me anyway, when I first did that with a f- couple of friends, it just felt like the floodgates were open then. And, um, and then once I did that, also what I found as well was, I don't know if any of you felt similar, but you know, like in Harry Potter, this is going to be a weird reference, but you know, in Harry Potter, then (laughs) okay, beautiful. Well, you know, in Harry Potter, you're not allowed to say like Harry Potter is not allowed to say Voldemort. Like you're not allowed to say it because it gives power to it and this, that and the other. I genuinely felt like my problems were like Voldemort in the sense of like, the less I spoke about it, the more power I gave it over me. And then it's almost like, you know, like when Harry Potter gets that point, I can't remember which film it is, but he goes, basically says, oh, fuck this. And just like start screaming Voldemort type thing. He's like, I'm not scared of it anymore. It felt like that. And then every person I told what I was going through, they're like, I just felt lighter. And then I'd tell the next person and then, almost i'd get to the point where i almost felt like i was telling it about someone else yeah like it was so i kind of diminished its power so much that it almost felt like i wasn't even talking about my own experiences anymore i was talking about you know it might as well have been a book i was reading do you know what i mean and i like that felt powerful to kind of just keep talking keep talking keep talking to the point where sometimes i would talk to friends and i'd be like oh well you know what happened like with my family in italy and like my friend would be like oh, sorry, man, I don't think you've ever told me. I'm like, oh, no? Oh, sorry, I've just told so many people now. I forget who I haven't and who I have. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But if you've got half an hour, let me fill you in. Um, and like, but it's that's, that's like, it's a powerful thing, but it is having kind of that friendship group that will allow you to to have those conversations, you know, which I think is is, is massively important. I think it is very easy, sorry, to dismiss. Um I, I was the same. I'm, I'm sure you were as well. Like before when I was in uni and, and before that as well, my mum was trying to be a psychotherapist and she would always come in and sort of try and have conversations. And it was, it was the running, running joke that you always made. Like, oh, shut up. I don't want to talk about that. You're trying to therapize me and whatever, but actually vocalization. And I've had the mm-hmm. experience twice in my life, both when I was going through this thing where you, you vocalize it, even if it is literally just yourself in the mirror. Uh, I know it's the cliche being like, I'm not okay, but actually saying it out loud and actually accept mm. the fact that you're not okay, I genuinely felt this weight lift off my chest. And it's like the most euphoric feeling. Although although you're still going through it, like it is one of, it's inexplainable, like how good it makes you feel to just vocalize it and mm. say it out loud. And once you've said it out loud, that is, in my opinion, and from my experience, the first step in, in being able to deal with it. Yeah. And I think there's such importance in that. And every we always say, like, just reach out to a mate and, and it's simple really to speak to them but i think i read an article the other day where it said the danger in the word just when it comes to just reach out because just suggests that it's an easy thing to do to just reach out to a mate and go for a pint just speak to them just go for a pint just have a chat because it's when you're going through that i can tell you now i'm sure you boys feel the same it's not just it's a fucking hell these boys um uh, alpha male steak eating rubby playing beer drinking geezer and i'm about to tell them yeah. and so i said something to my dad because i hadn't told my dad about it and I, I said look this is not just it's a massive i'm going to tell you something here that may very much change your opinion of me or how you see me as a person and for a while mm. i'm scared of that happening uh being like god i, I don't want to see me as weak or as as, uh, as fragile um but it's something that needs to happen i think on our side and as people have been through it or anyone listening to this don't wait for a mate to reach out and they need help you really sometimes need to be there and be like look i I'm, i can see what you're going through just talk to me about it if you want to. I'm, I'm here, but don't wait for them to just reach out because it's 
just isn't it just isn't isn't just and i think once you do reach out to people once you vocalize it once i have spoken about it so much more and i went through pom and i opened up to my family about what i was going through because i mean growing up there wasn't really a we all kind of cry at the dinner table or speak about our feelings. I mean, my mum's from an Irish background where that kind of emotional oversharing is not really a thing. And my dad grew up in Wembley um, with four brothers where that definitely wasn't a thing in terms of talking about your feelings. But I spoke to my dad about it. My dad was like, well, it's weird you say that because I used to have Pat Because my dad's the same as me, really outgoing, really, really chatty, lovely, lovely bloke um, with the same thoughts that I do. Um, but he, he said, look, I went through exactly the same thing. I, had, I used to have panic attacks or like feelings of anxiety. But back then in the 70s, 80s, there was nowhere near as much awareness of it. So he honestly thought at a point he was going fucking crazy or just like thought there was something physically wrong with him in his chest when he felt like mm-hmm. he could breathe. And I think we're almost quite lucky in a way now that we've got platforms like this, like you guys fighting the good yeah. fight where we can be like, look, just normalize it, man. Because you will not believe how many people have come up to me since and been like, mate, I, what, you, what you spoke about, what you posted about on POM with um, the panic attacks, with the anxiety, or the feeling completely numb and, and useless. I felt that as well. And it's, it's so bizarre. There's people you never expect, which I think is the massive thing. Obviously people you do expect feel it too. But it, it mean, there's, mental health doesn't give a shit who you are. It will, it will come for you if, if it gets the chance. Mm. There's a, Weird. Sorry. There's, sorry. Uh, I, there's still there's still friends that I, am, I would call sort of very, very close friends that I wouldn't reach out to and say how I'm feeling because I feel like I'm burdening them. Mm. And there's, there's always, and I think this is what the, comes with the stigma that is still surrounded with mental health is... I feel like I'm burdening them by telling them my problems and it, and it's about trying to understand how, how do you get over that feeling of guilt? Because I know there are friends that just won't know how to deal with it. So what I'm not going to put them under this pressure to think that they have to come up with an answer. But I think it's, I think it's about teaching them that actually just, just listen to what I've got to say. Um, yeah. It's what's important. I, it's funny you say that because I was, when I say that I was speaking to friends and I tell anyone and, and the dog about my problems, the one person who I kind of shielded it from and did whilst they knew what was going on, I really didn't like speaking to them about it was my girlfriend. She's been my girlfriend for seven years and she studied drama therapy. She's probably the, out of everyone that I know the best place to like, listen, to know what she's obviously when you do like a therapy course, you have to take therapy sessions and she had some similar family problems that I've had. And it, like what you were saying is I didn't want to burden her. And it's not because I didn't think she would be able to handle it. It's because I thought, well, if I tell her how often I'm thinking about this, if I tell her how like every day when I'm walking, when I'm left with my thoughts, if I'm in the shower and I'm walking to work, when I'm at, I'm all, like, it will, something will happen and boom, there it is. She'll think I'm suicidal. Like she'll think like, she'll, do you know what I mean? So I would almost happily tell tell my mate who I speak to once every while because I'm like, oh, well, I'm not going to tell him again for another three, four months. Whereas if I tell Louise that if I'm honest with her, I'll tell her today, I'll tell her tomorrow, I'll tell her the day after that, I'll tell her the day after that. Yeah. And, you know, and like it really, if, if it affected our, I mean, she was, she's just a beautiful person, but she, like it affected everything. It affected our sex life. It affected, because, you know, there were basically in my family, um, uh, like what the the, the the big thing was was like it's a sexual abuse thing with a family member basically abusing another family member of mine and then we realized that that family member had abused a few people um throughout basically throughout his life and so if it, it affected my like it affected my sexual life because i would you know like you know we're young whatever i'd go to kiss my girlfriend and my girlfriend would go to kiss me and it would like revolt me it would like repulse me because like i could see this person's face my uncle's face like like it was there and it would like it would freeze me do you know what i mean and like but i didn't want to tell her all this stuff because i was like and i'd wake up cooking is what like is my salvation i love cooking stereotypical for an italian but it's just true i would wake up at 5 a.m and i'm like like my girlfriend like what are you doing i'm like i'm just making some pasta sauce like just some anything to take like my mind off it and but i didn't want to tell her constantly because i was like she's gonna be like seriously worried that like at any moment i might top myself here which i never felt like i got to that stage fully but that's why i didn't want to tell her and i feel like some people do that as well where they don't want to tell their parents or maybe they've got a really close like sibling or whatever it is because they know that if they do that that close person will keep on checking up you know in a good way obviously but if you tell someone who you know you're only going to see every now and again it's like oh i've told them that and i don't have to revisit that because i'm probably i won't see them for like another month or two and it's easier do you know what i mean yeah. it speaks a bit more about it now 
Um, yeah, I speak to her more about it and we have more conversations in general, just about like in general about mental health, um, partly because of this podcast and she helps me with getting guests on and, you know, we've, we've got a few planned with some dance therapists and uh, music therapists and stuff. So she'll talk to me about kind of those avenues, but I still sometimes like if I've had like a thought that day, I won't necessarily be like, uh, come out with it. And she'd be like, Oh, by the way, like today I thought about like my uncle or whatever. I, because sometimes it's just like, you know what? She's, she, I just, it's stupid. I should tell her there's no excuse. There's no excuse for it, but I still have this almost like protective thing for her where I don't want to like, yeah. Burden yeah. Is, is the right way, but I don't want to burden her, you know, and it's a, it's a ridiculous notion, but I mean, it's hard to kind of fight that notion as well in the same breath. It's funny. Cause I think it's, a big misunderstanding on a lot of our parts where we think if we do something uh, like express this with somebody, uh, we're putting a burden on them. But actually, if this person deeply cares about you, it will actually improve the relationship because they appreciate the fact that you're being vulnerable. And then it can possibly like open up the avenue for them being vulnerable uh, in a later date. Mm -hmm. But it's like, if, if it's, it's kind of like what Seb says, like the more you can talk about it, the less, uh, tight you are about yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and so like I, I feel like a lot of my relationships are closer now because i'm so comfortable with talking about things and then a lot of my friends are comfortable with talking to me about the things because they know i'm not going to judge them or that i mm. think that's them now because they've had these thoughts or um mm. but yeah I, I i wish i wish that we were like taught about this in school like hey no this 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 means that you're closer together as a friend. And if you keep it all inside, then you're going to, your feelings of being alone are going to increase surely. Yeah. I, I mean, as well, like obviously everyone's is different and what, I've, what people are going through is different, but with mine being that it was like kind of family triggered. So we had the sexual abuse thing. And then like a couple of years later, or a year later, my, my like parents got divorced, which was like the cherry on, on the cake. It's not, that's not their fault, but I'm just saying kind of all happened in, in sequence. Yeah. And the other thing as well with telling Louisa is because Louisa, my girlfriend, seven years, she knows these people intimately. And it was like, I didn't want, I would happily tell someone who maybe had never met my Italian family or never met my parents what I was going through. And if that meant I kind of bad mouthed them, I wasn't too bothered because I was like, these people don't know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Whereas like with it was Louisa, I was like, I don't want like her to think of, even though not necessarily my parents, but my family have been a bunch of like, there's no other way of putting it. I don't want her to think of them as a bunch of because she knows them like these this is still my family i had this like complex of like my my image of found of family was completely shattered and yet i was still trying to up, uphold that image of family Do you know i'm protective and this that and the other and it was like it felt really hard because like i don't want her to see basically i don't want her to see my family for who they really are because that's it comes down to that do you know what i mean and it was like whereas like yeah i could tell you or something because you've never met my parents you never met my my auntie, my uncle, whoever. So for you, it's like, it's just this abstract person that I'm talking about. Whereas my, my girlfriend spent hours and hours, days on end with these people. And now she's finding out that like one of them's a, a bloody pedophile. Like what's that all about? Do you know what I mean? And I didn't want her to kind of, to sully my family net, like my family name, my family image yeah. with like going through this stuff. And, but yes, yeah, so it's like, like Jim says, it's stupid. And, and, and actually when I, we have spoken about it, it has brought us closer as a couple because now, we share these things more more often than not anyway. Uh, and it g does give that level of understanding and it changes the dynamic of, I'll be happy, I'll happily say it, you know, I had this kind of thing where I wanted to protect it, you know, this chauvinistic, misogynistic kind of like viewpoint. And it's now completely flipped the dynamic of our relationship where I now realize that she can protect me just as well as I can protect her. Yeah. And she can help me and solve my problems just as well as I can do that for her. It's not a man and, and a woman thing. Do you know what I mean? It's just a human thing. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's been important, that evolution. And I think that's such an important thing within a relationship, especially the person closest to you that you can have that sort of bond. I mean, if, if you speak to my girlfriend, my my girl, she's she's had the absolute brunt of, of my thoughts and my wishes and, and kind of what's gone on with me, me and my head for well, the three years we've been together. So mm. she, I guess we've got a lot closer through that. And she's probably the first person I spoke to about it, about how I felt and how low I felt, which is a tough one because it's when you're getting to know someone like that on a romantic level and getting closer to them, it's like, fuck, is this going to freak them out? But as soon as you've kind of broken that initial barrier and you can have those conversations, it's made us so, so much closer and so, so much, I suppose, more better off really and a lot, a lot of time mm. as, as a pair as a team which is obviously the ideal really so um yeah thanks uh cheers isla
<laughs> um, I mean, without further ado, so wh- where did this kind of beer eye thing start? Was this did this start because you'd kind of opened up with your mates about your mental health problems, and you kind of all realised, oh shit, like maybe there's something here that we could actually kind of promote the conversation that we're having right now amongst other groups of friends, or, or yeah. how did this all start for you guys? I mean, I think the main part of it was was during lockdown. To, to get a picture of, of what beer eye is, it's basically a YouTube channel where we. Um, we say there's more to beer than boozing. So the opportunity to go for a pint with your mates or a glass of wine or a water or a coffee or a tea is a great chance to have a conversation where you can talk about anything. It might be sport and how shit spurs are. It might be religion, yes. politics. Uh, it might be mental health. And I think mental health is an important one. So we're not saying that going for a beer with your mates is going to make mental health better because I mean, realistically, it's probably not. It might be a bit counterintuitive, in fact. But to open up that conversation is a great chance to do it. So we were, it was during lockdown. And I think a big part of our friendship group and us as boys, we used to go out drinking quite a lot together. We did it at uni. Um, and mm. as much as I'd like to go camping with the boys and go hiking and do fun, wholesome activities, the majority it's of what nice. we do is, yeah, it's not <laughs> uh, a lot of it is actually getting absolutely blattered. Um, and then taking the piss out of each other the next day for uh, who Instagram storied what by accident or who text who and, and what they put on yeah. Snapchat or whatever it might be or something stupid they said. Yeah. Um, during lockdown, obviously, Sure, I'm sure similar to you boys, the majority of what we were doing day in, day out was Zoom pub golf and Zoom pub crawl and, and Zoom pub quiz. Mm-hmm. It's like, fuck me, man. On Zoom, you can only have one person speaking at once. It's like, it's, it's like, a, it's like a, everyone take a turn to speak. It's not like a conversation. It's a, everyone gets a monologue and you've got to react to it. It's like you're reading a script. So it was so shit. It was horrible. Every yeah. Zoom crawl oh, was shit. Pub quizzes, well, I mean, <laughs> that marginal knowledge has increased about 15 fold, which I don't <laughs> mind. But I think apart from that, it was like, God, I missed not the pub, but I miss seeing my mate mm. having a, just a bloody good chin wag. That sounded really that was posh so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a bloody good chin wag. No, oh. I'm just going for a pint and getting absolutely slaughtered and talking to the boys about absolutely anything. You, gotta, I, you cut that out and they get ripped to shit. No. <laughs> we'll see. We might keep it in. <laughs> <laughs> I've never even said that phrase in my life before. Now, I don't know. I pulled that. That's what the podcast on. does to you. No, no, I was working Nola Holmes last night, so it must have been picked up from, uh, <laughs> from Cavill in that. But um, anyway. Um, so we thought, God, what can we do now, now that lockdown's been lifted, just to, just to be like, look, we realise the importance of going for a beer with your mates and having the conversation, the ones we missed having and couldn't have because we were stuck in our rooms, but let's just share it with everybody else and, and have some fun doing it. And I mean, Jake, feel free to add on to that because I'm monologuing here, but um, that's kind of the, the crux of it. Yeah, I, I, I think George has summed it up pretty well. I think I think the idea is just to take to take having a beer and take away the stigma that you have to go out and just get drunk with it. You can actually go to a pub and sit down and have a pint or coke, lemonade, whatever, whatever's your tipple, and just have a chat and a conversation. It doesn't have to be about uh, getting absolutely battered. It doesn't have to be about uh, having the best night of your life. Um, you can be there for an hour. You can be there for half an hour. And I think it's just trying to take that stigma away and just and just show um, three mates who really like each other just having a good time, just having a good time, experiencing. Um, experiencing beer, understanding beer, and then also chatting about mental health because I think I think alcohol is a very, very uh, prominent factor in why people struggle with their mental health or can be a can be a very big detriment to people's mental health. Um, and so I think tying these two things in together, showing that you can have alcohol um, and you can have a drink whilst talking about your mental health. Um, was what we wanted to achieve from it. That's what I, I'm really interested to see how it goes, which is because, unfortunately, my experience uh, with, like, uh, say, for instance, we're going out uh, with the lads or whatever, and after a few beers, maybe five, six beers, things that probably wouldn't come up usually sober are going to come up. And I'm not talking about, you know, like, you know, uh, food or something. This is yeah. usually something that they've kept deep in and mm-hmm. now they want to express it because you know they're they're at a different state of consciousness or whatever. Yeah. And unfortunately, sorry, they've got their beer balls. That's it. And unfortunately, I like I'm. I think what you could do is really draw the line in the sand and say, hey, you know, we can have the beers, but we can also have this, and it doesn't have to. Then, so for for, for instance, in my experience, I see I've experienced a lot of the lads bring this up at a night out. It gets quite intense. I felt this way, I felt this way, you you weren't there, or some, like these things that they've held deeply inside. And then maybe someone will say, oh, here, we'll just talk about tomorrow. We'll just talk about tomorrow, you know? And uh, tomorrow comes, and it's not brought up. 
you know, and maybe it comes up again in another two or three months after another few beers. But I'm thinking like it would be great for you guys to just like, you know, for people to see it. Like sometimes you just need to see it before you can you can express it. Yeah. And I think on our side, it's definitely something we're learning to do ourselves. I mean, we uh, put my hands up here without naming any names because the, the listener will know particularly who, who he is. But we've had points in our group at uni where we get absolutely battered and we end up <laughs> between mates fist fighting. Uh, and again, again, a few clips around the air, a few black eyes thrown about over such ridiculous shit. Um, again, that's a story for a different podcast. Um, but ridiculous stuff, man. And um, it wasn't just him. Everyone, everyone, whenever we were booze, we'd wind each other up to the point where it would turn a bit sour, turn a bit nasty. Um, nothing was nothing was off limits. And I think that wasn't positive or healthy, especially when you're going through your own shit to have your own mates chucking, a, chucking your own shit in your face. Um, not 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 literally. That would be a, that would be a night. But um, <laughs> Yeah, so I think I think for us, the whole thing with beer eyes, obviously understanding there is a line between having a beer and talking, and then getting absolutely mortal when uh, and then taking the piss out your mate's girlfriend for someone she got with five years ago, whatever it might be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Karen. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the things that I most appreciate about living out in Madrid. Like, it sounds stupid, but the fact that in Madrid you can go out for literally two beers, and when I say two beers, they're not even pints; they're like half pints, mm-hmm. and then that's a night. Like as the. the the notion that you go out for the purpose to get drunk in kind of, in, at least in Mediterranean Europe, to my experience, doesn't really exist. Don't get me wrong. They get drunk every now and again, but it's like, that's kind of a byproduct of, Oh, let's carry on the night. Like this is really good. Let's just keep on yeah, going. Yeah, but like yeah. where, and I've always kind of had that mentality, I suppose dad being Italian has kind of always brought up that way with alcohol. But I remember I would like sometimes go to like pubs with my mates and they can neck pints more. Do you know what I mean? And I like, I was just like, mate, I'm here to have a chat with you. I haven't seen you in like a couple of months, but like, and it gets to the point where some of my mates, they'd get so blattered that you would just, by the end of the night, they're repeating the same, like, it's literally like, like they're like a, 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 what's that thing? You know, where you put like money and music plays out. It's like one of them ones. You just like, they're just repeating the same thing over and over again. And I'm like, I'm not going to say their name as well, but because they don't know who I'm talking about. But like, <laughs> <laughs> but like, it's just like, bro, like, come on. Like, I haven't seen you in three months. And now all you're doing is you're just saying the same point over and over again. And it's not even necessarily a good point, but you're just absolutely smart. You don't know whether you're coming or going. And it's like, is this really what the night's come to? And don't get me wrong. Like, I love to get, like, we always do like um, a, a Christmas reunion. And on that night, we start at 12, like midday, and we go until last man standing on that day and days off. And I think that's fine. I'm not saying you should never get drunk, but I'm just saying like the fact that I think in England and I think Jim as well in Ireland, there's like this, this kind of acceptance that you can't, no one ever has one pint. Like who the fuck has one pint? That's a ridiculous notion. So if we're going to go to the pub, I mean, we're there for a purpose and that purpose is to get shit faced. Yeah. And like, if you guys can help change that kind of mentality slowly but surely with doing what you're doing and showing that you can actually have a nice casual pint or whatever, like you said, whatever you're your tipple, but like just have one and the purpose isn't to get pissed. The purpose is to see your friend and catch up with your mate and it's just accompanied by a nice pint or a nice whatever it is. I mean, in Ireland, I couldn't get enough of the creamy Guinness pints, but like, do you know what I mean? But I mean, that that one... Yeah, that one I would drink about 10, but that's not to get drunk. That's just because I couldn't get enough. And I knew when I'd come back to England or Madrid or wherever, I'd have watery Guinness. So I had to like stock up. Guinness doesn't yeah, travel I had well. Yeah, stock up. Think. No, it does not. But you know what I mean? Like if you could do that, guys, I think that would be, that would genuinely be like, it would be a monumental change because I think, especially with blokes as well, I think it's such a thing. You know, you, I do see like you know, my girlfriends and they like, they do actually do normal plans where they'll meet up for like a brunch or whatever the fuck it is yeah but even with them it's starting to like pop in now bottomless brunches seems like now no one can go for a brunch without having un- un- copious amounts of champagne and it's like well what just happened to having like a bit of avocado on toast do you know what i mean but if we can kind of like change that and just get it so that we can just have a normal conversation and if a few pints are involved that's fine but like let's not have the target of getting shit faced yeah i think that's such a bet and also the other thing as well like what Jim was saying, when when you get really drunk, you then all of a sudden, you know, what is it? Drunk, um, a drunk tongue speaks sober word, sober thoughts, or something on those lines. And it's like, I think a lot of us actually rely on alcohol as a facilitator for these conversations. And it's like, oh, I can't actually have like. So if I I know that I want to tell Jim this thing, 
but I can't call him or just meet him in like a, a calf and just tell him like, oh, this is what. So I know what I'll do is I'm just going to get absolutely blotted. And by the time I'm seven pints in, eventually it will come out. And it's like, if we could kind of like, if you could help change that dependence on alcohol to facilitate a meaningful conversation, then I think, I mean, you're onto a winner there. Do you yeah. know what I mean? I mean, I think we've, uh, we've given ourselves quite a challenge of taking on <laughs> Yeah, we're bigging it up. <laughs> yeah, we're bigging up massively now. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I might have, to, might have to get an appearance on Good Morning Britain to, uh, to try to tap into <laughs> or something in a later programme. But yeah, I think for us, I mean, a massive thing is, and I'm not saying we don't get drunk anymore and, and, and get blattered, but there is such, an, such a not, something nice about going for one pint with your mate or meeting your, meeting your mate for a drink or whatever it might be and just... But they must have a chat and a catch up. And I think mm. if that progresses, mm. getting drunk, then so be it. But I mean, that shouldn't be. My dad always said you should never go on a night out just to get drunk. If you get drunk as, as a as a part of obviously having a good time and and enjoying your night, then so be it. But there should never be the target of a night out to go and get battered. And I think uni culture did nothing for me in that regard. And for a long time, I didn't realise there was a difference mm. between uh, going out and not getting battered. So I think there's been a massive yeah. for me in trying to convince myself and all the boys at uni that. We can go out and not get absolutely steaming. And sometimes I ride the line on that. I can't pretend I don't. And I know people who listen yeah. are calling me a fucking hypocrite right now. So <laughs> I can't put that one too much. But um, it is important to do it. And I think it's so, so key. But I think also it's accepting the fact that actually it, it's a little bit like um, when you say just reach out. Um, it, it, sometimes it's not as, it's not as easy for, for certain people to, to just go for one pint. They have one. And that is, that is the gateway to them be like, okay, do you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to have more. Um, so I think, I think this notion of, it is absolutely fine to go out and get drunk and, and yeah, of course. encourage it. I think it's a fun thing to do. Um, but I think, I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't try and sugarcoat it and be like, it's very easy to just go out and just have one drink. Why, why is no one doing it? Um, and actually, <laughs> and actually for some people, I think it is a, it's a hard thing to do. It's a step-by-step process. And actually it may take a little bit of time to get used to it, but actually once you've done it once, yeah. Um, and you can see the benefits. You can wake up, you can feel fine. You have a nice conversation. That's when you start to sort of break the mold and break the stigma around it. Um, but it's getting people to do it. That's, that's, that's the thing. It's the stigma. Jim, like, do you want to talk about like the stigma? Like what we were talking about a couple of months ago. Can you remember when you said like, cause you traveled a bit and then you came back to Ireland oh, yeah. and then you were kind of saying how you're not too keen on like getting smashed and you're just happy to have like one or two pints and you came across this like a bit of a stigma yourself. But- yeah, well, uh, two things I have to say because it's a good point Jake brought up. Like, for some people, it's incredibly difficult. Like, what you mean? For ten years, I've been going out and having several beers. You just want me to take one now? Like, also, what what I found difficult when I was like trying to like move away from getting loads of beers. I don't know if you've experienced this, but it would be very common for me to go right. I'm going out. I'll just go for a few, and then when the boys are going somewhere else, I'll I'll head home. And then obviously, nine nine, nine times out of ten, I end up going out with them. And I'm thinking, why am I doing this? And it's because you're not a rational man after like three beers. You're not the same man that you left the house, you know, <laughs> and you're, you're enjoying the atmosphere and you're enjoying all this. Uh, so that's true. And there's absolutely God and there's nothing wrong with getting drunk and having a good time. But it, what my mate says is, is the juice worth the squeeze? And for me, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze <laughs> after a certain point. <laughs> and yeah, it's it's phenomenal. The minute I heard it, like I heard it three years ago, I reference it all the time. But um, when I realized the juice was, wasn't worth the squeeze for me, I mean, I'd be going out on a Saturday and then on a Wednesday, I'd just still be in a bad way. And like I could make a joke out of it. Me and my mate would always make jokes about like three-day hangovers. But at the end, like there just wasn't... Any, anything funny you know for me anyway it was just like i feel awful here um i feel really like depressed uh, yeah, stop yeah, doing it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but so when i did this like it's it is incredibly difficult but like particularly in our cultures i think are quite similar when i came home to ireland it would just be so strange like people skipping rounds like sometimes i would say oh i don't want to i want this round and then people are like hey you're messing up the round like how are we going to do this or what we're going out but we're leaving at half 10 like particularly if it's a one-on-one and i'd say i'm I'm just gonna have a beer or i might not have a beer they say i'm just gonna be drinking on my own then and then if i think it encourages a different interrogation for them to say oh wow i'm probably uncomfortable drinking with someone who isn't drinking because maybe i feel like they're gonna judge me or maybe i feel like it won't be fun and then you go, well, what is fun? Am I not here to just have a drink with my friend? 
and it opens up a whole bag of worms but for me it's it's been difficult but like worthwhile to kind of just say hey like it's not worth it for me i still enjoy a beer too but i can't do what i used to do you know <laughs> overnight? like was it like an overnight thing for you like did you just wake up and like i'm not gonna do this or was it like a process and like definitely, it actually definitely a process man yeah. yeah, like man, I had some bad ones. Like I, I won't, I won't go into detail, but I had some bad ones where the next day I was just like, no, I'm not drinking again, ever, ever, ever. And then that happened several times. And then I think it was like a day when I wasn't even hung over. And then I just kind of go, why am I like, why would I do this? Like I think it was, I went a few weeks without drinking, um, and I realized like I really enjoyed waking up on a Saturday or Sunday morning. Well, like oh, yeah. and have, like ready to do something and then i thought wow like how much am i my life on my waist and when i'm just in bed feeling sorry for myself listening to frank ocean you know i mean <laughs> <laughs> i love frank ocean i still listen to him <laughs> time to frank ocean is not time wasted <laughs> no 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 because this is the thing there's another point to make frank ocean is best listened to not hung over though i don't think i don't know if i can appreciate it as much because i'm still feeling sorry for myself but uh yeah I, it was a big process man and i don't think i could have done it without some friends also just saying yeah i'm in a similar boat man let's do this if if all of my friends were still like sorry i enjoy getting fairly pissed or enjoy having several points because like honestly and this is what i think uh, i've had to come to terms with is that some of my relationships aren't as good anymore because some of my friends just basically like meeting up for beers and i don't look at them differently it's just i'm not as close with them because i've made the choice that like this is not how I want to link with my friends every time, you know? Mm. Um, but yeah, it's a good question, man, because like, I wish it was a, an overnight thing, but it's definitely not. No. Oh, no. I think that's, that, that's raised a good point on our side too. Cause I think having heard you say that, I don't think that's, that's something we've considered before as much as we like going out for a, a pint and talking that does tend to lead to a few more after that. So as much as that conversation starts, what we say there, and it's a good way to, to facilitate it. Mm. There's not much of a point. There's not many times that we just stop after those one or two and we, and we do keep going. So that's mm-hmm. a good point on our side too and definitely something to think about. I mean, I don't want to speak for you, Jake, but I, I very, very rarely only have one or two pints, even if I've got something to do the next morning because I just, I suppose, I suppose it's just ingrained in me now, which needs to change. But as you mentioned, it's a process. I'm sure I'll, uh, as I grow up and stop feeling sorry for myself on a, on a Sunday morning, and I, I'm just <laughs> more that I'll stop. Yeah. Genuinely, waking up on a Saturday and feeling fresh is, is just, I know it sounds sad as well. It sounds like an, an alcoholic, but it's just the nicest feeling. Yeah. It's, it's nice waking up at like seven, half seven and being like, I've got the whole day. Yeah. I've got the whole day to do something. Um, but I, I think it is just the stigma, like, and it, and it's just about breaking it. And that, and that's the hardest thing. Like I, I'm the same. Like if, if I go out and I go to a pub, you have one, which leads to two, which is a three, which leads to however many. Um, and you don't, you don't even think about it consciously while you're doing it. It's like, yeah, I'll have another. And I think that's that's the worst thing is that I do it subconsciously. I'm just there, like, yeah, yeah, get another one. No, no, yeah, yeah, of course. All right, fine, we'll get some baby Guinnesses in. All right, we'll spin the wheel. I'll tell you what, London prices make me think more than like once about having another one. Jesus, you get a round of like two drinks and it comes to, you have to get a mortgage out. I'm like, Christ almighty. I paid £6.20 for a pint of Guinness the other day in London Bridge. Man, we have a rule, right, where in Dublin, we refuse to pay more than five euro for a Guinness refuse to it just can't be done like it's you can't justify charging more than five euro for the point like, how is it, where are you getting this extra money like it's been gone yeah it's been- honestly for the, for the first few rounds of guinness you might as well just get a flight to dublin for what 20 25 quid and go drink sauce man pretty much pretty much <laughs> i mean the 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 culture this one thing i did love about like ireland is that like when like the culture around i remember like jim was like he's genuinely like teach me all about like guinnesses and like this and he'd be like oh there's am i right in saying there's like hot taps jim or like is that the phrase that you'd be like oh there's certain pubs where like you know like which tap so like if the barman goes to like this other tap you'd be like nah 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 please can you get it in, in like i want it on that tap and this that and the other and then you like oh this even within dublin there was like certain like pubs which you knew had like better better guinness and then didn't and then we went to galway and i i swear to god i'll remember this for like the rest of my life i went to galway it's just me and like how many was five irish guys something along those lines and we go into like this pub and uh 
we all get like these pints. Obviously, I'm a, I'm like a Guinness novice, but I'm loving it. And then we all like sip these pints like you like simultaneously. And then all the Irish guys like just basically like turned to each other and basically just went like something along the lines of, like top five or like whatever it was, top three or whatever. And, like, what? <laughs> and then they were like, "Oh, this is like in the top five Guinnesses we've ever had." And I was like, "Oh, I feel privileged." <laughs> yeah, it was. Lad, yeah, I feel privileged. If you ever come to Dublin, uh, uh, we'll have to take advantage of it. But basically, a rule of thumb is if you're getting Guinness, and if uh, I know people can't listen and can't see me, but if you can't, like, if you blow at the side of the Guinness, and if you can't see, like, some of the foam, like, vividly move, like, if it's still, like, more liquidy, no. Really? Yeah, yeah that's, that's, <laughs> a, that's a bad point. I mean, I remember Seb told me that in, in, in English pubs, it's very often that they would just – do the the can thing wouldn't oh yeah they just pour like a yeah, can yeah, yeah. Can and then like put it on and then like the little shaker thing yeah. Yeah. oh yeah, yeah the shaker yeah. thing and then, oh, oh yeah. yeah and then like i remember jim was telling me about like how because like, man we went to so i was with his mates in like this one pub in dublin and then it was like my round so then i went up and like ordered and then it was like oh the bar was like oh like i'll bring them over to you and i was like oh this is fucking good service like in england you don't get that and then we were sat down and i was like jim like it's been 10 minutes like how long does it take to pour a pint and he's like oh now you gotta let it rest yeah. So like they pour it like three quarters, yeah. And I was like, bro, in England they just smash it in, they give it to you. It's basically like water. It's like brown water, and that's yeah. it. It's like I mean, Christ. Is, yeah. Which, Maybe you got... 190 on. seconds for the perfect pint in Guinness. Is it? Is that the is that the figure? Yeah, I, I think it's it's debated amongst some heavies, but yeah, more or less. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we uh, we when in the end of first year after exams, uh, all the uni boys went over to Dublin and. My granddad's he's or he's from Bally James Duff, so a bit up further north. But oh. he, um man, so he said that if you go into if you go into a pub and you see no one else drinking Guinness, yeah, don't, don't do fucking drink Guinness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then we uh, we ended up going to um, I mean I'm sure Dicey's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what a nostalgia from that was during the Euros when Will Griggs was on fire was up uh, or Shane Long's on fire was pumping out all over <laughs> all over. Dublin. But I love Dublin as a city. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, man maybe maybe you guys should do like a, a beer eye a special beer eye in dublin oh, like a feature be beer eye. and we could yeah, go we could go to the best ones we could go to the oh, best man, you know, jim when you said earlier in dublin i was thinking god if we get a few episodes out we could definitely go to dublin for a special and have you like, <laughs> have you guys on that'd be incredible that'd be, yeah wow. that'd be unreal well there we, well, go. There we go guys <laughs> anyone who's listening keep out keep your eyes peeled <laughs> here we come um but man, like Jim, is there? Did you want to talk about hangovers before? Like we wrap up about how they keep on top of their mental health? Is that because I know you said you wanted to like? Uh, yeah, I, I think it. I call it kind of cover my hangover thing. Um, it, okay. If I, yeah, I I guess my point was just that. Um, I guess what came to mind was when we were talking about Guinness. Yeah, I think in Ireland we like romanticize Guinness. It's like it's like this gift, you know, and I think. That's like half, like halfway for us to reach in a point where we could have four or five and not like 10 or 12 in that, like, I think often in the culture outside of this, it's just maybe we don't appreciate the, you know, like Seb saying in Mediterranean, they sip the wine and they're like, this is tasty wine. I enjoy this. I might have another one. There's, this is just a great time to be alive. I think very often we're just like, yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's not that bad. And actually, the third one was better than the second one, but I don't know why. You know, it's it's, it's not because I got used to it. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I I guess that's one thing that I that I appreciate about the, the Guinness like process is that we really do think it's like sacred, and, and you're I think you're more likely to, um, you know, like you said, you're like your Jake said, like he's unconscious, just getting another beer, getting another beer. I think like if you kind of like I don't want to like make drinking beer sacred, but like if you just take your time and, and really appreciate it, I think that could ha- really help you instead of just going, yeah, get another one. And, and another thing in Ireland, what Seb said was we will get another round, even if we're like halfway on the current beer. So it's like, mm. it's very often to see a fresh point beside one. That's a quarter full yeah, still, you know, we're really just like, add it, add it, add it. Constant, yeah, yeah. Constant. Keep it going. Yeah, keep the guard on. Yeah. I think that's one thing. The reason we've, so if you're beer right, we're trying to target more small breweries, tap rooms, and more IPA places because there's genuinely a bit more flavor in those and a bit more care. And mm. I'm, sorry, I'm not trying to say it's like a, an ancient ritual like it is with Guinness in terms of how they make these uh, IPAs, but there's so much character in each single one of them where they thought, this is why we made this, and this is why we added this. And 
we based our brewery around we're going to one today called Bianca Road in Bermondsey where they've got all the cycling gear up there and loads of stuff in there is kind of themed around the fact that the bloke who owns it Reese really cool guy but he's a cyclist and all the care they've taken into making those beers and those IPAs is, is kind of with, with him in mind like this is why I put this in there this is why I created this so there's a bit of character there as opposed to going up to your local spoons and getting a Stella, like a, Stella or a pint of Foster's for two forty nine. Yeah, yeah. Going out tomorrow anyway and isn't even brewed in Australia um, <laughs> yeah. so, um, that's kind of what our target is I mean I, I'm not a big fan I don't want to sound like a bit of a uh, a, a beer snob. Uh, yeah, a beer snob. Exactly like a beer snob, but um, I don't really go near any lagers anymore, any kind of main tap stuff. I mean, the most mainstream you'll see me going without sounding too indie is probably a, a Camden, Camden IPA. Apart from that, man, <laughs> the Guinness man or a yeah. Rogan IPA. The Rogan name it has, and the, and the more jazzy the can is, that's where you'll find me. None of that. None of that. That's it. Nonsense, yeah. That's great. Man, I, one of my. One of my, uh, my my uni mates, uh, Alex, he like my housemate for like the whole throughout uni, and he's an absolute. He is a beer snob, and he'll happily admit he's a beer snob to the point where, I mean, I was like, I think you're taking it too far now, son. His parents got him like a small amount of shares in Brewdog, which actually is now a good. It's a good investment for his birthday, and then and then worse still, and this is not a word of a lie. He has an app where like you take a picture of like whatever it is like your your like can that you're whatever and then like it goes on to, it's like almost like a facebook of bits Untapped. and then i like, pe- might be that one yeah. i remember all i remember was i was with him in a brew dog bar in leeds we went to uni and we're having this thing and he gets this like the darkest stout beer i've ever seen in my life it looked like tarmac and then he just takes a, he's taking a picture of like and he's not like an instagram or anything so i'm like what is he doing i'm like mate what are you doing he's like oh it's this app um and I was like, "You what?" And he's like, "Oh yeah, it's this app like where we, if like there's a community and like we all upload each other's beers and like then we rate each other's beers and we talk about." It. And I was like, at first, I was like, "You are a loser, or something." And then I thought, <laughs> "You know what? If you've got like a passion, I'm all for it." Like, it, yeah, there you go, yeah, there it is. Yeah, yeah, untapped. See, what? Yeah. yeah, see, and I was like, "Man, if you've got a passion, then I suppose you know what? I can't fault it. Like, I'm I'm snobby about stu- like I'm snobby about tomato sauce, man. If I see onions in a tomato sauce." then that can get thrown out the window as far as I'm concerned. But do you know what I mean? Like, as long as as long as long you've got a passion for it, then uh, it's beautiful. And I suppose you need a passion. If you're going to create something called beer, right, and you're not snobby about beer, then I have to question what you're doing. Exactly. That. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Taking an interest in it and taking, like caring about what you're drinking. I think yeah. It just makes you appreciate it more. And maybe makes you, yeah. makes you think, actually, I don't need to get fucked on this. I can have two. I can enjoy the flavour. It's like having a milkshake. Yeah, you yeah. Have yeah. Eight milkshakes. Well, well, you, you might. might. Yeah, yeah. You might. <laughs> <laughs> depends what day. It depends yeah. how bad the hangover is. Because that yeah. strawberry milkshake will go down a treat. Wow. I tell you. Eight of these of a hangover. That'll do well for the obstacle. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, just one more question. But, but I wanted to ask. Um, are you going to be? Is there like a non-alcoholic brewery that you have? Yeah. That's interesting. So, a big thing for us, obviously, around the whole, we can't preach it doesn't need to be a beer and then make it all about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think a large part yeah. of us is, and I mean, I, again, I, I'm someone who, if you tried to hand me a, a, a alcohol-free beer, I'd be able to taste it from a mile off and then be like, fuck that. But we actually had some in the first episode and I didn't clock there around alcoholics. I think it's um, definitely something we're looking to do and, and try and take one at least. I mean, it's meant to be sober October, so if we can get another episode out in October themed around uh, non-alcoholic beers and we're definitely going to do that mm, we've yeah. got some mates who don't really drink and i think if we can include them in that with um on, like kind of making those non-alcoholic beers a bit more mainstream and a bit more acceptable yeah rather than uh being an absolute weapon juice um then it's, it's kind of worth my theory um yeah. I'd, I'd order i'd order a, a non-alcoholic pint in a, in, a, in a pub but i suppose the, the journey we're trying to go on here is to make it so we don't need to get battered every time and if there's a, a nice one that we can share and talk about then absolutely fantastic and i'm all for it yeah basically basically hoping that you don't feel embarrassed ordering one i think that's yeah, the thing. yeah that's, <laughs> that's a big exactly thing yeah. a big thing you want to be able to walk up to a bar with your chest held high and be like yeah i'll have the non-alcoholic and like be like yeah, yeah. i ordered that yeah that's my yeah, yeah. Be like yeah. your heineken zero think, like with the shoulder yeah, yeah. exactly like- but man like talk talk about what we were saying like if you could do that like if you think about it if you order a beer because you love the taste of a beer that means you're not ordering it to get pissed. Mm, yeah. So if the beer tastes the same, non-alcoholic or alcoholic, then 
and you choose to go for the alcoholic option just because like you don't want to be that gimp who only has non-alcoholic and that proves that like you are drinking it purely to get battered like for whatever else you want to say if they taste the same and one's not i remember it, it's not great it's not a great bit but i think i had a i think it was a heineken non-alcoholic uh, yeah and i swear to god i couldn't tell the difference honest to god i couldn't tell the difference exactly that we couldn't tell the difference yeah. i couldn't believe it. i was almost i was almost embarrassed i was like god i, I call myself this beer it was beer, it was beer king, and suddenly I couldn't even clock it with yeah. alcoholic. And I was there like, yeah, that's the Heineken. And I'm like, that's <laughs> yeah. the Heineken, because I've had a Bex Blue before. And I mean, I mean, Bex I, Blues I, are great. Yeah. I think Bex Blue are going to Yeah, that, it's like not, here, they're not they, great. Uh, Bex Blue tastes like someone mulched up Weetabix and tastes like, ah, oh, shit, yeah. 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 Yeah, no, but yeah, listen, if if I think that'd be a great idea for you to do the uh for the Nike one. If we can meet up in Dublin, then that would be a dream. Oh, mate, I'm, to have Jim I'm very keen. show us yeah, right. Yeah, I, Jake will tell you I get very carried away, carried away with these ideas and I make these things happen once I've got an idea in my head. So now that's 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 getting sorted. It, getting it in now. That'll be that'll be uh, that'll be the bollocks out if we can get that done. <laughs> yeah. Be- beautiful it. stuff, beautiful stuff. And uh, before we wrap up, we always do, like I said, um shout out to Rosie, it's her segment. But um how do you keep uh, how do you keep your shit together? So if you do guys could just kind of no matter it could be literally even if it is just going for a, a chat with your mates whatever it is um that helps you kind of keep on top of it all so maybe hopefully some of our listeners listening might even be able to like kind of use it for their own their own lives yeah well um, cheers rodo for the uh, suggestion on this segment it's a nice little addition but um yeah, yeah i think besides going and watching beer i uh, on youtube and subscribing to our social media channels <laughs> what you can do to help is honestly is, is reach out and i think i do a lot of reading around kind of mental health and mental well-being and I listen to podcasts like this and to be honest i i went for a period end of last week where i binged all your podcasts back to back when i was at work oh was, poor like, bastard no no sorry man not, <laughs> um, that, the one with on like kind of masculinity and kind of father figures and the one on, on porn, pornography i was like fuck me this is incredible but um, i'm hoping this has the same sort of effects but a lot of it is just educating yourself and making sure you're aware of what's going on in that space and and if you're feeling down or feeling low then just realizing there's there's well you're not the only one and i'm not saying it's going to make it any better but Feel free to DM us on, on the BRI Instagram channel. We're always on there to have a conversation or to facilitate a chat if you want to meet us for a pint, provided you're in the London area or unless you want to pay for our travel. But um, <laughs> so feel free to drop a message. We'll, we'll get a call, but then we're happy to help anyone. But I think for me is just keep educating yourself on it and just keep making yourself aware of, of what's out there and, and, uh, and how you can help. So self-help books, podcasts, YouTube videos on that sort of area and kind of mental conditioning and mindfulness Um all do the absolute job for me. I mean, I can't pretend I'm doing much yoga for my mental health, but I mean, I've heard it, it works well for some people, but find something that works for you and stick with it. Hmm. Um, I, I, I think personally for me, it, it genuinely is uh, acceptance of the fact that you perhaps are not okay. And then vocalization of how you're feeling. It's very easy to sort of sit in your, sit in your own head and think, oh, okay, I feel like this, I feel like that. But actually saying it out loud and, and whether you say it to yourself in front of the mirror or whether you say it to a friend or whether you say it to your parents or whoever it might be, I, I genuinely believe, and I was always of the belief that uh, you don't need to speak about stuff. You can get over it. Like, come on, like, let's grow up. Let's grow up her bikes and just get over it. Um, but I think vocalization and speaking about it is by far and away the best thing that you can do beautiful stuff beautiful stuff guys even though you did a bit of um a bit of a plug there we always let people plug so where can people actually like catch you and whether it's palm whether it's beer eye whatever it may be where can people follow find out? our instagram which is beer eye huh? hq at beer eye hq yep uh our youtube channel if you just type in beer eye, it should pop up although really awkwardly about two days before we posted our first video another beer eye popped up as a as a channel and made a video so oh. like, oh, shit, <laughs> if he's not pick up we might have to change the name and also if we get <laughs> Because originally we, we kind of based off the idea of queer eyes, you know the um yeah you know, yeah yeah most yeah. wholesome show yeah. ever created. <laughs> so kind of nick their name. In um, so if it gets that big, we might have the uh, we might get the uh, the Fab Five calling us out for some copyright infringement. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> if you might come across this, um, boys, feel free to follow, give us a shout out. We'd love to meet you guys for a, a pint or a Sauvignon Blanc. Um, but yeah, just, no worries. Basically, we've got all our links in our Instagram bio. If you're really check us out there. Um, there's no need to plug our personal. Uh, I'm not that arrogant. Um, but if you want <laughs> feel free to do that <laughs> <laughs> beautiful stuff well guys we'll put that in the uh, show notes all the links will be there so anyone can click and uh, start following beer eye or pom welfare or all the rest of it um, just want to say thank you so much for your time it's been an absolute pleasure my boys I mean I know we've, we've had this in the um, in the office for quite a while now but really appreciate it mm. I, I love the fact that you boys are doing kind of fighting the same fight that we are 
Um, yeah. Good fight, boys. Really looking forward to seeing where you boys go and hopefully uh, see you in Dublin. But thanks for having us on. And it's really nice to be a podcast literally based around mental health. I think it's amazing. So thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Appreciate thank you. you. Legend. Guys. Bye. Hi, guys. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review if you haven't already. Every review helps us climb the podcast charts so that even more of you can listen to our amazing guests. We really appreciate the support. Remember to tune in next week. But until then, keep safe and have a good one.